All right, so it's a great pleasure to be able to come here and share our ongoing work about uh, trying to find new therapies for intractable epilepsy. So I have nothing to disclose. Um, and uh, I would like to emphasize from the beginning that this is a highly collaborative project. It's being driven largely by a postdoc in my group, Achira Roy, but it's been a really sort of center-wide collaboration between cyber and also neurosurgery colleagues, um, primarily Rita Mirza, who uh, collaborated with Bill Dobbins to do the genetics and uh, the electrophysiology I'm gonna to talk to you about because I'm not an electrophysiologist um, has been possible because of Nino and Frank. And then more recently, Steve Seps has helped us a little bit as well with some uh, in, uh, Western analysis. Okay, so the story actually begins a little before 2012 when there was a breakthrough uh, from the human genetic side and, and uh, what I want to emphasize throughout my talk today is a theme that rare disorders can give insight into more common disorders. And the rare disorder that we we're talking about today are megalencephaly syndromes. So these are brain overgrowth syndromes. And in 2012, a big, huge collaboration uh, led by the Dobbins Lab, but also including Rita Mirza, who's here at UW, uh, Jay Shen Jury, uh, a lot of other people showed that these overgrowth syndromes are caused by mutations in the PI3 kinase pathway. Okay, so what are these overgrowth conditions? These overgrowth conditions actually are a whole spectrum of malformations, which individually had been classified as separate disorders, uh, but the genetics unified them. So uh, these are mosaic mutations mostly. These are not germline mutations. So the mutations are in the area of the body where the overgrowth is. And so this kid here has this huge lipoma, uh, vascular overgrowth as well. You can see that this child has a massive leg that's overgrown, just a few digits here. There's lymphatic malformations here uh, in these two kids. So these children had the unfortunate happen during development so that a mutation happened during embryogenesis in the specific areas where the overgrowth was. And those genes in the PI3 kinase pathway, which I'm gonna to get to, cause overgrowth. If there is mutations during development that end up in the brain, you can get a whole range of brain overgrowth malformations. I'm gonna get back to that first, but first I wanna tell you more about the PI3 kinase pathway. So PI3 kinase is composed of two units, a regulatory subunit and a catalytic subunit called uh, encoded by the PIK3CA gene, which I'm gonna talk about a lot. And the role of this kinase is to convert phospholipids PIP2 to PIP3. Um, and uh, this is a, reaction that is countered by the action of a phosphatase called P10, which many of you may have heard of it. So PIP2, PIP3 regulate levels of this kinase, which fundamentally converge on AKT. And AKT gets phosphorylated, and it's a phosphokinase that has a whole bunch of different targets, one of which uh, is mTOR, which is mammalian target of rapamycin. Um, and there are a numerous, or there are a whole plethora of uh, cell, cell functions that are controlled by this pathway, transcriptional, repression, activation, apoptosis, cell growth, metabolism, all kinds of things. This pathway is actually very famous for its role in cancer because mutations in this pathway can cause uh, uh, tumor overgrowth. Um, however, we're talking about developmental malformations, and in fact, these kids are largely not susceptible to tumors. Um, there are various pathogenics in this pathway. All of them have this fa same functional endpoint of overacting and driving this pathway. This phenotype spectrum overlaps that somatically seen in ca cancer, and we're going to talk about this much later, but I want you to keep in mind that because this pathway has been well studied for its role in cancer, there's a whole plethora of 
of pharmaceutical agents that target this pathway to turn it down. And one of which is probably familiar to many of you is Everolimus or Serolimus, which I'm also going to refer to as rapamycin. Okay, I've introduced the pathway. The gain of function genes cause these overgrowth syndromes, but also loss of function of these genes also cause this overgrowth syndrome because they're overactivating this pathway. Okay, so what are the brain malformations? I promised a little more detail. There's a spectrum of malformations, all the way from focal cortical dysplasia, all the way to hemimegalencephaly or dysplastic megalencephaly. In fact, um, there's one child who, who has an AKT1 mutation who uh, had a brain size of two standard deviations above normal. Um, and again, this is a spectrum of malformations with increasing phenotypic severity and the extent of brain involvement is related to its developmental timing of the mutation. So if the mutation happens earlier, more of the brain will be affected. If it's later, just a small bit of the brain can be affected as seen here in focal cortical dysplasia or FCD. So I entered the picture once Bill and Rada had found these genes because there were clearly a lot of questions. How did these genetic mutations lead to the pathological phenotypes? And can we use that mechanistic understanding to get to uh, novel treatment mechanisms or novel treatment therapeutics? The question is, can we recapitulate all of these phenotypes in mice? And what does that tell us about how these mutations cause these phenotypes? And can we use that as a platform to test more therapies? I'm not going to bore you with the details, but there was some very complex mouse genetics involved to uh, take this gene here, which is the PI3 kinase catalytic unit, PIK3CA, um, to uh, drive the mutation specifically to the brain. And we had two alleles. We had uh, E545K in this helical domain and a H1047R in the kinase domain here. Interestingly, these are exactly the same mutations that are seen as hotspots, mutational hotspots in cancer. Those are the mutational hotspots in these developmental disorders. And we had mouse mutations that we could control in uh, and generate phenotypes uh, for both of these alleles. And what did we find? So we, we've actually been publishing on these series of animals since 2015. We have shown that the mice have abnormal brain size, they have specific cortical dysplasia, and hydrocephalus and epilepsy. I'm not going to tell you more about the hydrocephalus story, although I think it's really exciting. We've understood where the developmental hydrocephalus comes from, how it arises, and potentially uh, therapeutic that can uh, prevent the hydrocephalus, and it's converging on the same molecular pathway of interventricular hemorrhages uh, due to prematurity. Uh, so it looks like there's a convergence of mechanisms between acquired hydrocephalus and genetic hydrocephalus. Uh, don't have time to talk about that. I'm going to focus today's talk on epilepsy because uh, one of the, as many of you are aware, uh, focal cortical dysplasia, uh, people with focal cortical dysplasia often have intractable epilepsy. And it's thought that at least 50% of all cases of pediatric focal cortical dysplasia are caused by mutations in this pathway. So it's really critical for us to study why these mutations are, why these uh, malformations arise and why they cause epilepsy. Just to give you some idea of what these mouse phenotypes look like, here is the hotspot that causes uh, hydrocephalus. Um, you can see a normal mouse brain here, and without knowing very much about mouse brains, you can see this is a very dysplastic, horrible, uh, hydrocephalic mouse brain. You can see this slanted or the domed forehead shape, and you can also see there's all kinds of ongoing cortical dysplasia here. Um, interestingly, from studying this, not only did we understand more about hydrocephalus, but we actually learned about brain folding, and we think we have some understandings of more mechanisms about some of the earliest, or the earliest mechanisms that actually cause mice brains to fold. 
um, which is odd because mice brains don't usually fold. And the, the upshot is that mice actively prevent folding. Um, they turn off the pathway that causes cortical folding in other mammals. Okay, so I'm going to focus on a series on these series of animals. Um, Here's a control section, and these are brains from animals where we activated these mutations at different times in development. If we activate it during late gestation, we get a slightly big brain, but not huge. If we activate it much earlier, we get a huge brain. If we activate it postnatally, we get a normal sized brain. All of these have dysplasia. There's uh, migration errors in the cerebral cortex. Um, you can't really see all the, the, the problems in the cerebral cortex at this uh, level of resolution. However, you can see size. Uh, what we conclude from this and other studies is that the PIC3CA related brain phenotypes depend both on the mutant allele, we get hydrocephalus or more severe hypoplasia depending on the allele and its time of activation. And what we have come to conclude is that uh, these, these mutations have to work in embryonic progenitors of the cerebral cortex uh, during development. And it does, the, the role of PI3 kinase overactivation when the brain is actually formed and ongoing neurogenesis is minimal, minimal has nothing to do with brain size. Okay, so without showing you all the data, we have shown that the mechanisms behind the large brain is due to a whole bunch of things that went wrong during development. There's cell density issues, there's cell size, there's migration, there's proliferation, there's differentiation issues and white matter overgrowth. What is central, however, is that all of these mice have epilepsy. And I'm going to focus on just control mice these huge big mice where we activated it during embryonic development and the animals that seem to have more or less normal brains and yet they are also uh, epileptic. Uh, and we call these huge brain mice, mag, mag mice, megalencephaly mice, and these normal looking sized mice, uh, FCD or focal cortical dysplasia as models for mag and FCD. Uh, thanks very much to Frank Kalume, who is on this call, and I'm very grateful that he's here because he can answer any questions about the electrophysiology, which is very much beyond my expertise. Um, but Frank has shown, uh, together with uh, John Skibo and uh, Achira Roy in my lab, that the megalencephalic mice show epileptiform activity, control, Here's mutant, you can obviously see that the EEG is disturbed. Um, and even in these focal cortical dysplasia mice, you see interictal spikes that are either regionalized or generalized. Uh, and uh, Frank has additional data on these animals showing that even though these FCD mice again look somewhat normal, their electrical activity is not. So one way to see if mice actually are truly epileptic or have epileptic characteristics is to test if they are more susceptible to seizures in a induced seizure model. So uh, these, uh, what we chose to do all of the remaining analysis on are the animals who are the mag mice with the very huge dysplastic brains at postnatal day 35 when they are young adolescents. These animals were treated in a paradigm where for one hour, nothing was done, but they were observed by video EEG and uh, just by video. Uh, and then we subcutaneously injected PTZ, which induces seizures. And then we recorded for another 30 minutes and scored behavior on uh, a number of criteria that define seizure characteristics and seizure severity. And what you can see is that in control mice, which are the white bars here, this dose of PTZ gives seizures in a, in a large number of animals, but not very many control animals and not very many seizures, either number or severity. And you can see that the mutants had 
a lot more seizures, which were more severe. Uh, this is data that's for those make mice, but we have almost identical data from the FCV mice. So that's cool. We have a mouse model of megalencephaly and, and focal cortical dysplasia epilepsy. What about how this epilepsy is happening? So uh, as a proof of principle, what we did was we administered a drug called BKM120, which is developed by Novartis to target glioblastoma. It's a P pic 3 ca inhibitor that crosses the blood-brain barrier, is concentrated actually in the blood, it, uh, in the brain, and reaches peak pathway inhibition in one hour. Uh, and measured by how phosphorylated phospho-AKT is, which is this downstream gene of PIP3. Okay, so what our paradigm was this time was we observed the animals for a bit, and one hour before seizure induction, we gave them BKM120. We let them sit around for an hour because we, we, we were counting on the glioblastoma modeling where AKT activity is peak, or inhibition activity is peak after one hour. And then we gave them the seizure inducing drug and, and watched them. And again, this is for the MEG mice, the FCD mice are very similar. This is the data I showed you before. So this is without, oh, sorry, no. So I showed you these bars here, the white and the big red. With BKM addition, we can prevent seizures in wild type, but more interestingly, we can actually normalize the, BK, uh, the, the mutant mice. So their activity after drug is similar to the control animals without drug, both in number of seizures and the duration of uh, the, the most severe seizure. This was really striking because we were preventing seizure activity in these animals after just one hour. So we have a way to acutely control seizures in these animals, despite the fact that these are MEG mice that have massive amounts of too much brain that's too, very dysplastic. So what this told us was uh, apparently these seizures can be stopped. We don't have to fix development. We can just tone down activity of this pathway. This pathway is actively driving epilepsy, despite all the dysmorphology, we can stop it. So that takes us to our more recent data in that why, why is PI3 kinase exquisitely sensitive to, uh, uh, why is regulation of PI3 kinase uh, important for controlling a neuronal hyperactivity? What happens when we're adding these drugs to stop the activity and, and can we repurpose some of these PI3 kinase drugs actually to be anti-epileptic drugs or anti-seizure drugs instead of just cancer drugs. To do that, we again collaborated with Frank and again, thank you Frank for being here as my backup. Um, so Frank actually did a lot of EEG analyses and showed <clears throat> that excuse me, <clears throat> that seizure activity is especially high in the developing or in the, in the hippocampus of these MEG mice. I'm not gonna go through this detail here, but you can see here's a cortex. The hippocampus has a lot of activity. We, we uh, leverage that because electrophysiology in slices um, is well worked out. Uh, for brain slices with focus on hippocampal pyramidal neurons. And so we sort of use this data to narrow in on what's happening in hippocampus of these animals. Again, Frank's lovely data showing that there is increased gamma transmission or activity in uh, the hippocampus, very much specifically gamma, not so much delta and theta and not so much difference between wild type animals in the neocortex. Okay, so we focused in on the hippocampus and we took brain slices and we're looking at uh, population properties. So these are wild type brain slices in black, here's mutant brain slice data in, in red. And you can see as we increase 
extracellular potassium, the neurons are induced to have hyperactivity. And in fact, that level of hyperactivity or, or the mutant neurons are much more excitable at lower concentrations of extracellular potassium than are the mutants, or the mutants in the wild type. Uh, what we did was we chose this concentration of seven millimolar when the wild type animals were not really seizing or the, the, the slices were not hypersynchronous, um, but the mutants were, and looked at that in more detail. And you can see here, without any drug, there's a somewhat of a lot, well, there's some activity, there's some hyperactivity. And in the mutants, there are hypersynchronous bursts that are happening in these slice tissues with low potassium or lowish potassium. When we add drug, we were really surprised to, to see that we are not actually silencing neurons, we're disrupting the hypersynchronicity. So you can see that these waves or of ictal bursts actually are decreased. So, so what's happening? How, how is this happening? So this led to Achira embarking on a big quest to understand electrophysiology. And, and truthfully, I'm lagging on my understanding. So I'm going to tell you what I can from this data. And again, Franck is our expert here. Okay, so by whole cell patch clamping, what did we see? So we're no longer at this, the tissue level, we're looking at the cellular level. In control and mutants, everything is colored black and white or black and red. So you can see that in control animals, we have different classes of electrical activity, tonic and bursts, and a lot of bursts. Uh, in mutants, we also have similar activity, but the proportions of these activities are changed. In particular, this burst class of neuron, we see a lot more of that burst class of neuron in the mutant animals. And actually, we see differences between CA1 and CA3, which I'm not really going to talk about right now, but you can see the tonic spike frequency in CA1 neurons is higher in the mutants and CA3, it's especially higher. Uh, these other characteristics are much less significant, um, but uh, there are things there. Uh, in, if you look at induced or evoked activity of burst firing neurons, there are, there are more of them. See, there's more cells that are bursting in CA1 and CA3. And really, it looks like there are intrinsic property differences between controls and mutants in CA1 and C2, or CA3, particularly in the time constant or the decay, or the, the I'm not sure how to say it, the slope of the, the slope of the recovery. Uh, again, I'm foggy on this, but Franck's here and he'll answer questions about this. What we then found was focusing on these bursts. We have a lot of cells that are bursting. What is driving that bursting? We added a series of drugs to inhibit synaptic transmission. And what this is to show you is that they pretty much did nothing. So these are intrinsic cells. When we shut them down to communication to other cells, these cells are bursting all by themselves. Adding extracellular cadmium we actually can reduce the number of bursting cells or change their frequencies. And this is a very dramatic example of a trace. Here's before cadmium and afterwards, we really kind of shut these up, which suggests that there is an underlying calcium dependent, a calcium channel dependent mechanism. Intracellular cesium also can normalize. So here's CA1, it's not doing anything. Uh, CA3, oh, I knew all this yesterday. I practiced this yesterday. <laughs> so Brock's gonna help me figure this out. But what the point is that uh, we saw non-uniform effects on CA1 and CA3. So uh, for example, very striking here, there's no significant difference in the cesium-induced burst frequency 
But in the CA3, there's an enormous difference. So what we're seeing is that there is an intrinsic property of these cells that are overexpressing PI3 kinase activity to burst and be hypersensitive, independent of how they're talking to other cells. What happens when we add BKM? Well, BKM normalizes these neurons. It reduces the burst frequency and reduces the, uh, uh, the, the re normalizes the difference between, oh my goodness, I really did practice this and under stress, I can't explain it, Frank. I'm gonna have to keep practicing. Do what Dr. Ogeman, Jeff Ogeman yeah. does, just make it up. Okay? I will. Okay. You can see that there's yeah. a big difference. So, so I think here the, um, uh, Kathy is showing that uh, now uh, in the presence of BKM, the hyperactivity of these neurons is reduced and uh, going back to the level that, uh, that is seen in control. And you can see that by uh, loss of the, the big bursts. And uh, right here, what's, what is shown in the B panel is... Uh, is the presence of, with the presence of drug, even those uh, tonic activities are reduced in their frequency. The big bursts are, are gone uh, when uh, the drug is present. And this is suggesting that uh, the BKM is uh, affecting these, uh, these activity. And even so acutely uh, in, uh, in, the, in the solution uh, when applied uh, in Thank you, Josh. So, so, so sorry to interrupt, but Rich, that, you know, first of all, <laughs> incredible that this works uh, in vitro like that. Second, it's not that you make it up, it's you have the option of 50-50 or phone a friend. So well done. <laughs> well, I'm very glad that Frank was here to be my friend here. Okay. No. Uh, okay, so BKM has dramatic activity. So now we have shown that BKM has dramatic activity in the whole animal, on the tissue level, and all the way down to the cell level. So how the heck is it working? And can we leverage that to understand how we can design novel therapeutics for these kids with uh, intractable epilepsy? So we took the next step down the pathway. So PI3 kinase is up here, affecting PIP2, PIP3. What happens if we stop this AKT? So uh, to make a very long story short, AKT basically does exactly what BKM does. You can see all of these drop, you can see tonic frequency is much more reduced, and in fact, these bursts are more or less eliminated. So that's great because PI3 signal, PIP3CA or PIP, PI3 kinase signaling has unlimited numbers of targets in the cells. AKT is one of them. And we're thankful that this pathway is hitting AKT because AKT downstream mechanisms are much better understood than all of the other things that PI3 kinase is doing. So then we decided, well, what's next down on the pathway? mTOR. And many of you probably have heard of mTOR. It's gained notoriety in the epilepsy field, starting with TSC patients. So TSC pa patients with mutations in TSC1, TSC2, loss of function, cause mTOR to have extra activity because TSC1 and TSC2 are inhibitors of mTOR. If you have mTOR overexpression or overactivation, it's been demonstrated in mouse models and also in human tissue that overactivating mTOR causes seizures and is epileptogenic. And not only that, but if mTOR inhibitors are put on mouse models or uh, even in clinical trials of TSC patients, there is significant anti-seizure benefit. But truthfully, if you read the fine print of those studies, it's not fantastic seizure control. There's 40% reduction of seizure activity in TSC patients um, and over time, these, these mTOR works. Uh, most of these studies have been long-term administration. You get reduced size of the balloon cells in TSC, and uh, it's thought that that is, is how the seizure activity is controlled with mTOR inhibition. And it's been shown uh, very beautifully by Jason Hoffman, who many of you probably know, has a study showing general benefit of uh, mTOR inhibition 
in uh, FCD kids of undetermined genotype. Okay, so all of that is background. What happens when we put mTOR acutely on these slices? So again, we're talking one hour or less and mTOR does pretty much nothing. So that's exciting or not, because what that says is acute control of this pathway at the level of AKT is really important for maintaining neuronal hypo, uh, uh, homeostasis and tweaking PI3 kinase signaling and AKT activity can dramatically control, uh, control seizures. Oh, I forgot to say that we actually proved that the, the rapamycin actually was having activity in the slices. It wasn't that we were just adding dead drug then we proved that by Western with Steve Sepp. So here you can see in normal and mutant animals, we see a lot of AKT activity in rapamycin control. Uh, and we also see a lot of phospho S6 activity in the mutants, um, which is downstream of even mTOR. But when we add all of these drugs, BKM, the AKT inhibitor, and the rapamycin, and, we're oh, certainly okay. controlling There was the a lag in your, in your slice, uh, slides. Oh. Yeah, okay, now we see it. Okay. What's really important here is that in all drug conditions, we are actually inhibiting this pathway. So rapamycin is having no acute effect on hyperactivity, but it is having acute effect on the pathway. So what we're concluding is that the mouse models harboring pic 3 ca mutations are epileptic, irrespective of dysmorphology validated across whole animal tissue and cellular levels. We have this novel role for PI3 kinase signaling in neuronal homeostasis dependent on AKT, but not mTOR, which is again, an interesting finding and somewhat against convention, which is probably having uh, contributing to our problems of funding these studies because there's a big effort or a big push in uh, the mouse epilepsy community, at least that mTOR is central to everything. mTOR probably has a role in these animals, but long-term we have this very acute window where mTOR seems to be doing nothing. AKT is responsible. We know that there's dysregulated calcium channels and dysregulated uh, potassium channels. Uh, enhanced burst firing is persistent feature of the mutants. The mechanism is unique or it's intrinsic to neurons. It's not dependent on synaptic transmission. And I didn't explain this well, but there are differences in pyramidal neurons between CA1 and CA3. And I want to emphasize that we think this is probably why seizures in this category of patients are intractable because different suites of neurons have different responses to PI3 kinase uh, pathway function. And so drugs that target single channels, which most anti-seizure and anti-epileptic drugs are, are not going to work in all neurons. We must target holistically this pathway, not different uh, channels. What, what we have shown is there's exciting potential to repurpose PI3 kinase pathway drugs to potentially treat epilepsy. And now because we've defined what the properties of, of this epilepsy on a cellular basis in a slice platform, we have a fantastic platform to test a plethora of drugs in this pathway to see if they're going to work as anti-epileptics or anti-seizure drugs. Then once we figure out which ones are great candidates in vitro, we can go back to the mice. Okay, so I'm really, I have two minutes to end and I think I can do it because I only have very few couple slides left. So one thing that's really become exciting is uh, these drugs could really be powerful. And what happens about other, other uh, epilepsies? So most FCD mutations actually are not PIK3CA. Predominant are mTOR gain of function mutations. Bill Dobbins and Rada Mirza have been working on that together with colleagues elsewhere. And so we are generating slowly and painfully um, PIK, or mTOR 
patient related mutations in mice. We don't have that data yet, uh, thanks to COVID. Um, what about other epilepsies that aren't even this pathway? They're not PI3 kinase genetic pathways uh, genes. And so some really tantalizing, exciting data that I'm going to show um, is some work that Franck has done where he has shown that mice with Dravet syndrome or mutations in the SCN1A gene, which have uh, loss of function or gain and gain of function, I believe, in the sodium all, channel. All, all loss of function. All loss of function. Okay, thank you. Really, Franck, you're my, you're my <laughs> phone a friend here. Um, he has shown that it's a disruption of inhibitory neuron function, but there's no known pathway involvement. But surprisingly, and very excitingly, BKM actually has anti convulsive activity in these animals. Here's EEG before BKM, after BKM, the interactal spiking is reduced. And this is my favorite data here from, this is the, uh, so Dravet syndrome animals are susceptible to- We, we, are, one, we are one slide back, I think. Oh, hopefully it comes. Okay, now it's showing, the EEG is showing. All right. So uh, Dravet mice are very susceptible to thermally induced seizures. And you can see in this first panel here that normal mice, it's the other way around. I think I mislabeled these. Uh, yes. These are, these are, these are normal mice who can withstand high temperatures and start seizing at higher temperatures, but the mutant mice all seize at lower temperatures and like, forget the key here. It's, it's uh, um, so Drave, uh, this here, these are Drave mice treated with BKM or saline. And um, in this case is uh, uh, the untreated mice will, right. have, will have seizure at lower temperature. So a small elevation of body temperature will trigger a seizure. And this is about uh, around the 38, I think the, the, the writing is small, 38.5 yeah. to 39 degrees Celsius. Thank you. In the Frank. presence of BKM, you have to go to higher temperature to yeah. trigger a seizure. Thank you. Phone a friend. Yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I practiced this yesterday and got it perfect, but under control, under stress. It's, all, it's all good, Kathleen. It's great. So, so what I, I think this is exciting because what this shows is that BKM actually has broader applicability to not genetic driven seizures. Um, there's some data that uh, Steve White and Melissa, 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 oh, I'm fading. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they have shown that in cornea kindled seizures that are induced seizures, not genetic whatsoever, BKM also has effect. So BKM is a generalizable pathway suppression uh, is generalizable to multiple types of epilepsies, which I think points to the fundamental thing that PI3 kinase signaling is central to neuronal homeostasis. And if we understand that and how it works, we can generate better therapeutics for uh, epilepsy. So I'm ending. Achira Roy has driven a lot of this and Frank is a superstar because he's taught me a lot about electrophysiology and very clearly I have a lot more to learn. Uh, Nino has also contributed, Steve Seps. These are people who've done some of the work and thank you for the funding and thank you all for listening. <laughs>